So we discussed here the question of the old law and the new law or the lower law and the higher law and the higher law which shall transcend all egoistic motives of action. And now we said first Sri Krishna starts with the demolition of the old law. What is the old law? That which is based on your egoistic motives. And what is the new law? That which is beyond the egoistic motives. That is the basic fundamental difference if you want to know. Now the teacher, the, the answer of the teacher proceeds upon two different lines. First, a brief reply founded upon the highest ideas of the general Aryan culture in which Arjuna has been educated. Secondly, another and larger founded on a more intimate knowledge opening into deeper truths of our being which is the real starting point of the teaching of the Gita. You see, one of the great advantages of reading this essay on the Gita is that we get very good logical analysis of the Bhagavad Gita. You see, we, you have a lot of other commentaries, you know, there are hundreds of them. But you will see there a kind of a moral, religio, ethical interpretation. But I find in Sri Aurobindo a wonderful logical and psychological explanation. So what happens is, I can relate myself to this book, the essays on the Gita, and thereby to the Bhagavad Gita. Otherwise, if it's too much of a religious-centric one, then you know you start questioning and you may not be able to really relate. So look at this analysis, he says, there are, and this is, you know, many of you may hear other lectures by, uh, by great pundits or gurus on Bhagavad Gita. But here in Sri Aurobindo, we get a very clear answers on the level of the mind itself. So first is the, is the general answer based on the Aryan culture in which Arjuna has been educated. And what is Arjuna educated? As a Kshatriya. In those days which we have discussed at length yesterday, that what is the basis of this four, fourfold ashramas. And we have seen at that point of time it was necessary, it was a perfect way of dividing the society on the basis of the temperament of the individual. You see, that's one thing that I have really come to learn in Sri Aurobindo, that everything seems to be evolutionary. There's nothing wrong in this world that has taken place. I mean, everything has gone towards the next step in evolution. You see, today the human being is supposed to be an integral human being. We said yesterday. And integral, not because Sri Aurobindo is telling, please remember. And my conclusion is, is, is I've told you before also in some other classes, Sri is the voice of evolution. Nothing less, nothing more. Today he has voiced the spirit of universal evolution. Called it the integral yoga. But take away Sri voice and still you see if you have a very objective way you read the human cycle and the idol of human unity and not having faith in Sri I don't care. But you get a wonderful analysis of how humanity is reaching or has reached the necessity of an integral personality. Be it cultural level, national level, call it human unity, call it cultural level, intermixing of cultures, call it the individual. Within me there is a Brahmin and the Kshatriya and the Shudra and whatever. So we are coming to the, to the peak where nature herself has brought evolution to an integration. And that has been given voice and word by Sri Aurobindo as philosophy, as literature, as this, 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 this. 
So I consider him as the greatest and the clearest and the most wonderful voice of nature and evolution. So that's where we see this question of Arjuna being educated as a Kshatriya and he should follow Kshatriya hood. Sri Krishna agrees. But today perhaps if Sri Krishna were to answer Arjuna's questions, he, he would not have done the same way. The first argument would not have been there. That is the way you are brought up in your Aryan culture of the times. Today what Sri Krishna would have said is the second answer. Which is the real, universal, eternal answer. So please distinguish that there is a time factor even in the Gita. In the very first chapter, if you remember, Sri Krishna Sri writes that there is very little of the time factor in the Gita, unlike in any other scriptures. He says, uh, there are two truths here. One is the belonging to the time, temporal, and the other is eternal. He says, every scripture must necessarily contain two elements. One temporary, perishable, belonging to the ideas of the period and country in which it was produced. The other eternal and imperishable and applicable in all ages and countries. And then he goes, to, goes on to say that in the Gita, unlike in other scriptures, there is very little of the temporal. You take for example Quran, there is a lot of temporal thing there. That is why the problem with Islam that they are stuck to the temporal aspect of Quran so much so they are not able to evolve. But in Indian scripture there is hardly anything temporal. Even the Vedas and the Upanishads and the Gita they have a very small part of the temporal which can even be overlooked. It doesn't matter. So we can be very flexible with Gita and the Upanishads and the Veda in our interpretation. But if there is too much of the temporal then it is difficult to go beyond. That's the problem with Bible and with, uh, with Quran. But with Gita, that's not there. But whatever is the little of the temporal, this is one of the factors of the divisions of the society of that time. So, Sri Aurobindo says here, this first answer on the second one is largely founded on intimate knowledge, opening into deeper truths of our being, which is the real starting point of the teaching of the Gita. This first answer relies on the philosophic and moral conceptions of the Vedantic philosophy and the social idea of duty and honor which form the ethical basis of Aryan society. Arjuna has sought to justify his refusal on ethical and rational grounds but he has merely cloaked by words of apparent rationality the revolt of his ignorant and unchastened emotions. He has spoken of the physical life and the death of the body as if these were the primary realities. The sorrow for the bodily death of his friends and kindred is a grief to which wisdom and, true, and the true knowledge of life lend no sanction. The enlightened man does not mourn either for the living or the dead. For he knows that suffering and death are merely incidents in the history of the soul. Well, here from uh, this para onwards, we get into the deeper philosophy, the real, what Sri calls the, the intimate knowledge and the deeper truths. Because the very first one, that regarding the Kshatriya is already dealt in the previous paragraphs where, where Sri Krishna says you, this is not the way of the Aryan. That single phase, phrase tells us about the Kshatriya hood, what you are, what your characters is, characteristics are. Do that. But now in the second part which is the universal part where he says that all your justification is only rational cloaking but the very, now he comes straight to the point. 
He says he has spoken of the physical life and the death of the body as if these were the primary realities. So what is the entire sorrow of uh, Arjuna? It's the death. If you really come to the brass tacks of the whole thing, it is the death of his people. Not his enemy, please remember. He doesn't consider them enemy at all. The Kurukshetra is there. Kauravas are not his enemies. Well, Kaurava as, a, as, a, as a, an army maybe. But most of this, you know, the real leaders of Kauravas are all his relatives or his pitrus or his gurus or something. So the essential factor here is again death. Very interestingly, you see the commonality between Gita and, and the Savitri. The whole problem of the Gita and Savitri begins with the question of death. What is death? And here in the Gita we see an attitude taken towards death, realizing yourself, what after all is death? Is the death of the, of the physical body the real death? Does our real self die at all? So it is a clarification of the notion of death. And you see again, centuries later, another great man, another great philosopher, another great yogi, another great avatar, takes up the same question of what is death. But this time in the, para in the story of Savitri and Satyava. And of course now he does not answer the question, he does not just seek the philosophic answer, but he goes ahead to transform death. But the theme is the same, please remember. So the whole of the Gita begins with the question of what is death? If you want to answer this, then you have to say what is life? What is a physical body? Because on this single concept of what is death, your entire uh, attitude toward life, towards life changes. So Sri Krishna straight away says, this question, the sorrow for the bodily death of his friends and kindred is a grief to which wisdom and true knowledge of life lend no sanction. He says, we in our inner wisdom do not consider the death of body as truly anything important. The enlightened man does not mourn either for the living or the dead, for he knows that suffering and death are merely incidents in the history of the soul. Well, this is really, I mean, uh, I mean that's why, I mean, when you see the Gita, I mean, if you have really closely read this, you are shocked, you know, to see um, suddenly Lord Krishna says, you know, he says, it is not true that at any time I was not, nor thou, nor these kings of men, nor is it true that any of us shall ever cease to be hereafter. As the soul passes physically through childhood and youth and age, so it passes on to the changing of the body. Then he goes on to explain what is life, what is body, what is death. Then this is the famous one as most of you know. I mean this is not born, nor does it die, nor is it a thing that comes into being once and passing away will never come into being again. It is unborn, ancient, sempiternal. It is not slain with the slaying of the body. You see, Arjuna is asking very pragmatic question that what am I supposed to do? He says, oh, uh, Arjuna said, how, oh Madhusudana, shall I strike Bhishma and Drona with weapons in battle, they who are worthy of worship? This is a very pragmatic question. But Arjuna, Sri Krishna, sort of, you know, what we say in English, takes off on another angle. Because as we said, he has already chided him, told him in one or two verses about his Kshatriya hood. He doesn't delve too long because otherwise it will become too much of a temporal truth. And as we said, Gita does not have much of a temporary, temporal truth. 
temporal and temporary too. So very soon Sri Krishna passes on to the inner truth and there he says all this is not important and then the enlightened soul will not really mourn for death or for life. The soul, not the body, is the reality. A single phrase, but that's the essence of the Gita. I mean, essence in the sense, as you know, Gita has three secrets. What Lord Krishna says, I will tell you three major secrets. This is the first secret. We will see along what are the other two major secrets. So he says the first secret is the soul, not the body, is the reality. All these kings of men for whose approaching death he mourns have lived before. They will live again in the human body. For as the soul passes physically through childhood and youth and age, so it passes on to the changing of the body. The calm and the wise mind, the dhira, the thinker, who looks upon life steadily and does not allow himself to be disturbed and blinded by sensations and emotions, he is not deceived by material appearances. He does not allow the clamor of his blood and his nerves and his heart to cloud his judgment or to contradict his knowledge. Now this is, you know, this line actually reminds me of something else that the mother had said. Uh, that all these kings of men, they will live again in the human body. For as the soul passes physically through childhood, etc., so it passes on to the changing of the body. In one of the contexts, you know, when there was a the discussion about religion, that how very fanatic we are with our own religion. She says, look, look at this question in, in a different way. That this body or this soul or this form, that so-called so-and-so, in this life is supposed to have taken a religion called Hinduism or somebody is a Christian or an Islam or a Muslim or something. But then she says the same soul must have been a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim and again will be something else in the future also. So where is this great fanaticism about this is the only religion, this is my religion? How can it be your religion? Because the soul has taken this today and yesterday, maybe the religion that you hate most today, the soul was that yesterday in, in the previous birth. So he said, these are all very superficial attitude. That is my religion and the greater than this, there is nothing. He says, soul does not have botheration of any religion. It is only bothered with the divine. And religions are passages, tunnels through which it passes and reach and wants to reach that. Sometimes you may take this door to exit or sometimes you may take this door to exit. But the intention is to go to that road. So which door you go through, does it matter? It doesn't matter to the soul at all. But it's we who make it so much important. And then she says, no, look at it differently. So she says, the calm and the wise and wise mind, the dhira, they are not deceived by material appearances. He looks beyond the apparent facts of life of the body and senses to the real fact of his being and rises beyond the emotional and physical desires of the ignorant nature to the true and only aim of the human existence. Well, I'll take up the next one because uh, this, this, uh, these sentences actually are taken, if you want to refer to, the, from chapter 2 of the Gita, from verses 1 to 13. Because these are more or less translations of the verses. Chap verses 1 to 13, chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita. Now the real explanation comes here in, this, in the next para. What is that real fact? that highest aim. This, that human life and death repeated through the eons in the great cycles of the world are only a long progress by which the human being prepares and makes himself fit for immortality. 
and how shall he prepare himself who is the man that is fit the man who rises above the conception of himself as a life and a body who does not accept the material and sensational touches of the world at their own value or at the value which the physical man attaches to them who knows himself and all all as souls learns himself to live in his soul and not in his body and deals with others too as souls and not as mere physical beings this is of course also based on verse 15 of the bhagavad gita but then the question is this is the one that the human life and death repeated through the eons in the great cycles are only a long progress well of course uh, those of you who have read shobindo and the mother do know that there is you know this spark of the divine called the soul which is there in matter then the mother explained that it takes innumerable births births in the sense of forms innumerable forms it takes and then that soul comes to the level of the human being and when it comes to the level of the human being it has around it a sheath a sheath you know it is the covering and that covering is called the psychic being what's the difference between soul and the psychic being psychic being is the sheath around the soul you know it is only at the level of the human being that the that the that the covering develops so you know i have given you often the example of a lamp the inner tungsten where the fct comes in and gives the light is the real soul but the bulb around that is the psychic being because without the bulb the inner light light cannot spread you see you break the outer bulb the sh- the cover of the bulb then the whole bulb is gone but if you are just the inner tungsten also it doesn't sometimes it is there but if you break the cover then the whole bulb is fused so in the human beings for the first time the soul develops a sheath and that sheath is the psychic being and then the power that comes into the bulb with 60 watts or 40 watts or 120 or 200 watts that depends on the experience of the of the soul through its several births that is what we call a mature soul or we call it a developed soul others all of us have souls but some are you know 40 words some are 80 some are 2000 why purely because of the evolutionary process maybe you know my soul has had only 50000 births and yours might be having 80000 births so there's a maturity of half an added 30000 births in your soul so the the power the lamp shines more it has gathered greater intensity of the divine power that is why we call one soul developed the other one more mature or less mature in this sense so this is an important thing and that's where he says is a long process is just this and because of this long process he says it makes himself fit for immortality so the greater and more the births of the soul now please remember there is one big factor the greater the number of the births which have been fulfilled not just a birth taken and then you are dead you see the soul takes a birth for a particular experience has it fulfilled in that experience or not it doesn't mean you know just 
30,000 births means this much ratio, no, of power. 30,000 births out of which maybe only 10,000 were fulfilled births. 20,000 20, of them were waste because you are not really fulfilled what your, what your soul had come for. You may have, somebody may have committed suicide, somebody may have died in the war, somebody may have done here. So it's an incompleteness of the experience so it does not give the soul the necessary growth period that it wanted. So we have to take this into consideration and not just don't count by the number of births. So you are 30,000, I am 32,000, you are 55,000. So, no. There is the other factor of the fulfillment. So that's where we say the soul takes on this repetition of life and death as only a progress. In Savitri 2 we have this line a long dim preparation is man's life. This is all a preparation for the immortality. And how shall he prepare himself? Who is the man that is fit? Now, this is a beautiful qualification. That who is the man who can prepare himself for immortality? These are the conditions. The man who rises above the conception of himself as life and a body who does not accept the material and sensational touches of the world at their own value, etc. I will not read that once again. For by immortality is meant not the survival of death. That is already given to every creature born with a mind, but the transcendence of life and death. This is something new again, which I think we have to understand thoroughly, because the very word immortality we think it is not death. M mortal and immortal. We think they are two opposite things. Mortal means one who dies, immortal means one who does not die. But that is not the spiritual sense of immortal. We say Vivekananda is immortal. Ramakrishna is immortal. What does it mean? Is their bodies are gone. So it's not the question of the physical Longevity which is immortality. He says he is one who has transcended life and death. That means one who realizes his inner self, the Atman. He is supposed to be immortal. But we must add immediately that in Sri Aurobindo, the word immortal really takes on the meaning as it, it is normally should. It's a physical immortality also. You see, till now the Vedic immortality was the realization of the Atman. But in Sri it is the physical immortality, the body itself will not die. That is the challenge that Sri Aurobindo has taken up. But which body? Is it this body that will not die? Or is there some other body that will not die? But the, the sum and substance is, in sure, the immortality is the non-death of the physical. I am not saying the physical of, the, of man as it is today. This body as it is has to die perhaps. But out of this body, a new body will evolve which will not die. So what Sri Aurobindo has said will be achieved, there is a body which shall not die. That is the immortal body. And Sri Aurobindo is working towards that body which shall not die. Whereas the Vedanta and the Veda said, you realize your Atman, you are immortal. So here, he is more dealing with the concept of the Vedas and the Upanishads, not his own. So here we can say that immortality is meant not the survival of death, but the transcendence of life and death. And this is also important from the scientific point of view, because science is trying to prolong our human body's existence. But there also it is not the question of immortality. What we want to do is the immortality of consciousness. It means that ascension by which man ceases to live, a mind-informed body and lives at last as a spirit 
and in the spirit whoever is subject to grief and sorrow a slave to the sensations and emotions occupied by the touches of things transient cannot become fit for immortality so obviously among the qualifications what we have seen if you want to have this inner realization of the atman automatically you your concept of life changes if you think that my physical body is my reality then you will mourn your death you see yesterday i think in one of the classes i was telling our life is very much guided by our own philosophy of life we may write it saying i am a shankarite or aurobindoite or a krishnaite or a vaishnavite or you don't have to even write it or know about it but you follow a definite philosophy of life a concept in your life and that's what i'm saying what is it that is life uh, that is a reality for you is it the body or the soul if it is the body then of course we all cry for the body because we think oh i've lost the reality but a yogi slowly comes to understand the body is not the reality it's a temporary thing as shri krishna himself puts it so so almost you know in an easy manner just as we change our clothes so the soul changes its body it is as easy going as that when we change a clothes when i throw away my dress i don't bother about it i just throw it away it is worn not and we burn it or use it for something else so the soul has got the exact attitude so coming back to the reading here so those are the qualifications and these things must be born until they are conquered till they can give no pain to the liberated man till he is able to receive all the material happenings of the world whether joyful or sorrowful with a wise and calm equality even as the tranquil eternal spirit secret within us receives them to be disturbed by sorrow and horror as arjuna has been disturbed to be deflected by them from the path that has to be traveled to be overcome by self pity and intolerance of sorrow and recoil from the unavoidable and trivial circumstance of the death of the body this is an aryan ignorance it is not the way of the aryan climbing in calm strength towards the immortal life well i think um, it's very clear here i mean the attitude is the same that we cannot give credence to all this pain to this suffering and all these material things whether joyful or sorrowful because as long as we are stuck in this material consciousness we are mortal let's call it spade a spade i mean i mean we we can apply to the modern times and we say that if you are really bogged down in a materialistic consciousness then your whole attitude towards life becomes the form becomes important and therefore the person the, the body becomes important and therefore we mourn over the death of the body but as shorn the puts it if you really live in the spirit well you know when we read all these things what do we gather apart from the meaning of the text that is a really a great evolutionary process again i am coming to that point that you know is is an evolution is the transcendence of consciousness you said living in this material world and attached to that our properties our people and our material things we really can't hope to have any kind of a of a not only living in the spirit but any peace any joy any ananda because they are contradictory in terms what i want to say is is they are contradictory in terms you you want to be here and you want to have the joy of that so shobhan would say no we have to evolve in our consciousness we have to rise in our consciousness so everything comes back to the question of consciousness so shri krishna also is telling us here 
that to be disturbed by sorrow and horror as Arjuna has been disturbed, to be deflected, etc., to be overcome by self-pity, etc., this is un-Aryan ignorance. And uh, obviously, you may say, Anand is good to know philosophy and is, is nice to read the chapters and explain in a classroom situation. But when there's a death in the family, your near and dear are gone. So how much are we shocked? How much do we get into depression? Well, uh, that is where yoga and, and yogi comes in. I've seen in the ashram and, and I always go back into my memory because fortunately I've had a childhood with, if I can say the word, with demigods around me. As I said somewhere that I walk with demigods and live with the God, with the Divine Himself or Herself. You see, there was again this question of Nalanida. And his closest friend was Amrita. They were neighbors, as you know, Nalanida's room and Amrita's room, they were neighbors. For decades together they lived together and uh, sometimes they ate together, at least they had a cup of tea together. So they were very great friends. But when Amritada passed away, he didn't even go to his room. He saw Amritada's body being taken out on the road and he had a glimpse of him from the window. So it's not that he was weeping over his close friend. And we have again Pranobda here, he's still alive. And his mother lived upstairs, just his office is downstairs. When his mother passed away, he didn't even go to see the mother. So it really demands not courage, but this question of the consciousness. What is it that you think is important? So even the mother, imagine one's own mother passing away, no shedding tears. So what I am trying to sort of impress upon our, ourselves is it can be done. It's not just what we are th- talking is philosophy. And I know people who have done it and who have, who have shown this kind of a attitude of consciousness. And we have also that great incident when the news of Mrinanli Devi's death came to Shavabindo with a letter in his hand, the tears in his eyes. I, I told you in one of my classes. So this great Mahatma on the death of his wife had tears in his eyes. How do you explain? See, so we don't know, is it really tears of sorrow, tears of joy, tears of pity, tears of suffering. But as he wrote to his father-in-law, he says, God chose me to give the only sorrow which could touch my heart. This entire universe, the only sorrow. You see, again, Sri was so humane. Let's not think that he is really looking into the infinity and then he is not with you and with me. And normally we are more partial to her in thinking that she is looking into the eyes and is looking beyond you. And there is a kind of an awe also when you look into Shurabindu's eyes and say, Baba, it's too big. But also this little incident, this small incident show us, no, he was humane very, very close to us. In fact, as I told you, mothers wrote to somebody that is extremely close to the human heart. We have only to call him and we think you call the mother and she is replying. And we have become so very prejudicial that we always say mother's grace, mother this thing, mother that. We never say Shurabindu's grace and Shurabindu came to me and all that. It's become a kind of a habit of the mind perhaps. But this is Shurabindu. And we have seen the yogi there untouched. So what, what I want to tell you is such an attitude is possible. 
that you take the body not to be the real reality and you know this great yogis like nolini da again i'm showing because i know a lot about nolini so i'm just repeating things about him he knew the time of his passing away maybe he had chosen it himself and then he asked his assistant to give him a particular drink mixed up of a few several drinks you know liquids he said he prepared that i don't know i mean exactly the nature of the drink so she prepared mixing this liquid that liquid that liquid maybe five or six of them she he got that he drank that and finished and it seems he left his soul from the head which a great yogi does great yogi soul leaves from the top of the head it seems so there you are so are they really i mean sad that i'm going to leave tomorrow or today this body how nice it would be this after serve in the ashram and i'm living living right under serve in this room no for them they know i'm going to i will come back in a different body serve the work so this is that immense detachment and that's a great liberation i must say i mean to be able to practice this kind of a thing is a tremendous liberation but how many can do well that's what is sadhana i suppose well we'll do one more para we can continue because this is a kind of a i mean as i told you as we go along he gets deeper into philosophy and i only remembered savitri with this there is no such thing as death for it is the body that dies and the body is not the man that which really is cannot go out of existence do it may change the forms through which it appears just as that which is non existent cannot come into being high philosophy the soul is and cannot cease to be this opposition of is and is not this balance of being and becoming which is the mind's view of existence finds its end in the realization of the soul as the one imperishable self by whom all this universe has been extended finite bodies have an end but that which possesses and uses the body is infinite illimitable eternal indestructible friends one thing that comes to my mind is you know all this philosophy perhaps we know we have read it previously in the gita and the life divine synthesis and you have your own sources but the difference is that sure have been the lord krishna this people they have realized it they are not telling you because of a translation of the bhagavad gita so the whole thing is we know that the body is not the man that the soul is the man but it is only a mental superficial knowledge because of which people really cry over things but there are people who are conscious and uh, either you know there's a, there's something sometimes you know suffering comes to, to the people at the end of their life maybe even to detach them from their own body and say hey i am not this body i am somebody else and i have some other mission to do and i have to go elsewhere so body suffering is a kind of a that edge of pain where you can disconnect with this body thinking that the body is the reality so a lot of people have gone through the stage where people said no i am not the body let me be somebody else so here it says we know that this is finite bodies have an end but there is something that is illimitable and indestructible 
It casts away old and takes up new bodies as a man changes woe not raiment for new. And what is there in this to grieve at, grieve at and recoil and shrink? This is not born, nor does it die. Nor is it a thing that comes into being once and passing away will never come into being again. It is unborn, ancient, sempiternal. It is not slain with the slaying of the body. Who can slay the immortal spirit? Weapons cannot cleave it, nor the fire burn, nor do the waters drench it, nor the wind dry. Eternally stable, immobile, all-pervading, it is forever and forever. Not manifested like the body, but greater than all manifestation. Not to be analyzed by the thought, but greater than all mind. Not capable of change and modification like the life and its organs and their objects, but beyond the changes of mind and life and body. It is yet the reality which all this strive to figure. Well, some of you may have recollected that this entire thing is a, is a translation from the Gita, so I did not stop at that. I have read one or two verses already. So this is, we know the regarding the immortality of the soul. But then there is this question, it casts away old and takes up new bodies as a man changes worn out raiment for new. I would like to ask you the question, if this is the same attitude that an Aurobindonian should take. This is a question that I always have. Gita has given us this. But today, can we take the same attitude? We know that reality is a soul. But can we throw away the body as unimportant, it's just a raiment, is the cloth, is the, the clothing that that can be shed off at any time without much of a, you know, a, a man changes a worn out raiment. I think I would like you to think on that. Because obviously, this is where Sri differs from the Gita. The truth is there. The truth is the soul is the reality. That is not what we are contesting. But this attitude to body, I think we have changed. Sri Aurobindo has definitely changed. Although it is a temporary reality, yet is it just a raiment for the, for the soul to experience and then throw it away? No. Knowing what we know, we have read Sri Aurobindo and the mother and the mother's concept of physical transformation. We cannot have this kind of a downward look to the body. At least that's my understanding. Whatever may be the, the problem, the weakness, the limitations of the physical, not only the physical, it's not just the flesh and the bone, this form, the manifestation of my mental, my vital, my physical, this is the, the complex, is definitely much more meaningful than uh, what is given in the Gita. Of course, Gita was giving it for a particular, uh, I mean, Sri Krishna was highlighting a particular truth at the cost of another, I must say, because he wanted Arjuna to not to weep the death of the body and, and all that. But now when we come to Sri Aurobindo, we say no. Even this raiment, even this embodiment is of great value, great work, great mission, great purpose. But that is uh, for sure. So if ever you want to see the difference between the Gita and Sri Aurobindo, we have one of them here itself. There are other differences which I will not talk about. But the attitude towards the body is absolutely different. Otherwise, Sri Aurobindo would not be there. So, Sri Aurobindo himself writes in one of his letters, the yoga of the Gita and the yoga and the integral yoga are quite different. 
although we think you know bhakti yoga and karma yoga and jnana yoga are the triple path of the gita with the famous word that we have and just recently the other day somebody was telling osho bind has taken the triple path of the gita no not at all osho bind has not taken the triple path of the gita whoever said that he has elements of the triple path but obviously he has made a completely different thing so this is one of the thing that you must think over and really i would say analyze it for yourself 